Welcome to the session on stopping poverty from going viral. My name is Nadia Riz. I'm professor of economics at the American University in Cairo, and I would like to welcome our esteemed panelists. His Eminence, Card Cardinal Peter Turkson, Prefect of the Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development of the Vatican City State, Dr. James Zahn, Senior Director on Investment and Enterprise at the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, Mr. Asif Saleh, Executive Director, BRAC, Bangladesh. BRAC is a world leading NGO with an award winning program, the Ultra Poor Graduation Initiative, that helps the world's poorest escape extreme poverty and transition to self sufficiency, autonomy, and dignity. Welcome to our panel. Our panel today is titled Stopping Poverty from Going Viral. The world's poor have been most severely hit by the economic repercussions of the COVID 19 pandemic. Indeed, the pandemic has and will push up to 150 million people in developing countries into extreme poverty this year and force millions in rich economies below the poverty line. The latest World Bank figures tell us that almost half the world is trying to survive on five and a half dollars or less a day. According to the International Labour Office, more than 500 million jobs have been jeopardized, most in developing countries, and more than 100 million jobs will have been permanently lost by the end of the year. Inequality has and will continue to increase between countries, but also within countries, both developed and developing. The threat is real for more hunger and malnutrition for the world's poor, with those at the lower base of the pyramid suffering the most, especially women, children, and the marginalized. Without bold policy actions for a more inclusive, resilient, and sustainable recovery, the COVID-19 crisis may trigger cycles of higher income inequality lower social mobility among the vulnerable and lower resilience to future shocks. Today, we need to discuss how to rebuild economies post-COVID in a way that is more inclusive, resilient, and sustainable, how to increase resilience of the economy and at-risk communities, what immediate action needs to be taken to prevent more millions of people going into extreme poverty. How can we stop poverty from going viral? My questions to your eminence. I start with your eminence, and my question to you is the following. You are leading the second working group of the Vatican's COVID-19 Commission that looks into rethinking our world post-COVID-19. In two minutes, would you tell us about this group and what it, it calls for? Thank you, your eminence. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, and thank you all of you for inviting us. Two minutes, I, I wouldn't... Now, so essentially, it is this. When the COVID pandemic broke, the Holy Father, who would already be showing interest and showing a lot of concern for the affliction of humanity, charged our office to create a commission to take charge of the situation and help a lot of local communities. So we put together five working groups. Now, the, second, the first working group maintains contact with the local groups around the world. And we've done conversation with a lot of them, trying to get, get to understand how they deal with the situation and how the Vatican can run some support. The second working group decided to do research, thinking and promoting you know, thought and reflection on the issue. And that has identified uh, five task forces. One deals with access to health care, public health care, equitable access to public health care and vaccine, which comes after this, job security, ensuring that people now I have jobs and if anything should happen to the job, how can the, how can the state step in to, to, to cushion them from the effects of joblessness and all? Then there is also the problem of security. Security first to talk about food security and security from conflict, so, uh, conflict related in our crisis. And so with food security, for example, we recognize that the southern part of the world. In the north where you go to supermarket to shop and look for food, it's not as bad. But in the south where you have to go to the market before you can have access to food. And when the COVID prevents people from bringing food to the market, then you run a real difficult problem of you know, people farming farming. And you've seen a lot of places when people try to get out to the market, then they face the police who sometimes shoot and even kill. So the issue of access to food is very real. And the third one is, of course, about access to technology and then communication methods to ensure all of this and make them happen. 
Thank you, Your Eminence. I now turn to James, and uh, I would like you to tell us uh, again in two minutes about the global setting. Would you share your views about the impact of the pandemic on global trade investment and what that has meant for developing countries, especially those living at the base of the pyramid? Thank you. James, you're on mute. You're on mute, James. Yes, thank you. Um, the pandemic um, caused a kind of a triple shock, supply demand policy, and that impact on trade and investment. Uh, regarding trade, that um, according to the uh, WTO forecast, that will be a decline of 9.2% uh, in volume of world merchandise trade, followed by a kind of 7.2% rise uh, this year. But having said that, trade recovery is slower in developing countries. In the least developed countries, the decline is much larger than the average. So this will cause a major concern. So that's on, on trade. On investment, the situation is, uh, is even worse. In a sense, um, in the sustainable development sectors, for example, uh, we, uh, we, we, we estimated that there's a need uh, of 2.5 trillion US dollars annually for developing countries that's the gap needs to be filled. And uh, before the pandemic, six out of 10 SDG sectors groupings uh, experienced progress in, in the increase in investment in SDGs. But this all has undone by this uh, pandemic. Um, last year, the investment in the SDG sectors declined by one third. So that's that's oh, a tremendous, in a sense, in all the major uh, SDG sectors, like infrastructure industries that include utilities, telecoms, all um, that that declined by 62 okay. percent, and 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 investment in food and agriculture, water and sanitation, health, education were all down by either one third or two third. So that is a real, really a kind of challenging situation for the international community, um, and and this COVID pandemic. Has really um, uh, has has really more than undone the progress made since 2015. Thank you, thank you very much, James. Now, clearly, this has had its toll on the uh, lowest, you know, the base of the pyramid. And I would like to move on to Asif and ask him to tell us about BRAC and the ultra poor graduation approach, how your activities were impacted by the pandemic, but also how to strengthen existing networks at the grassroots level, how to reinforce effective partnerships with governments to develop and scale innovations. Uh, so uh, uh, please go ahead, Asif, and you have asked for an extra minute in this round, yeah. which will be taken from the next round. So please, you have three minutes. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to explain our approach to ultra poor poverty, because that's quite very relevant to what we were talking about. So when we talk about poor uh, uh, people living in poverty, I mean, we should realize that there are not one big homogeneous group. Uh, there are stratas as well. And ultra poor group is that group which completely is at the bottom. They're almost invisible in the society. And they have no agency and in many countries lack any support from the government because they don't get targeted in any government schemes. So they're earning less than a dollar a day and they're capable but need handholding. So in 2002, BRAC started uh, working with this group, seeing that the impact of microfinance actually does, uh, does not, is not reaching them. So in any given village, we first went and asked the villagers to identify the poorest, the ultra poor. When we did, uh, what we did was that, that we gave them an asset and a training related to the asset. And, and it may be a cow or a goat or a few chickens or a small piece of land, and the training would be related to the goat rearing and the, or, or uh, vegetable, vegetable farming. So together with the technical training, our workers would go to their home and check up on them and work on their confidence building. And it can connect them to the rural elites, ensure, them, ensure that they didn't actually sell off their assets. Their children are going to school and they're having nutritious food. So poverty is a multi-dimensional problem. It's not just an income of poverty. So we gave them a stipend as well to ensure that they don't sell off their assets. So by end of this two-year intervention, we looked at nine different indicators like their earning, health, education, sanitation, et cetera. And if they had ticked the boxes, we call them graduates. So they have graduated out of ultra poverty and then they're on a path to self-sustainability. So this was launched in 2002 in Bangladesh. And then every year we graduated close to 100,000 families. 
So seeing this, like then we we tried with our partners in six different countries that whether this works or not. And this was very rigorously evaluated by Professor Abhijit Banerjee and, uh, and uh, Duflo, Professor Duflo, uh, who then basically resulted, uh, uh, the result was published in 2015, and it showed that it actually works in other contexts as well. And then the interest took off. So now it's replicated uh, in 46 countries in different contexts. But now we are saying to the governments that, look, if you are looking to improve your social protection system, this is a great way to do it. You're not spending money perpetually. You're giving them a path to self-sustainability. And from both a cost and efficiency perspective, this is a much better investment. So now we are working with governments across the world to scale through them the impact and the knowledge obtained from this Bangladeshi program. This is also a best example of government and non-government organizations working together where government spending is complemented by the sector's innovation and the community outreach. Now, the, the pandemic, actually, the inequality obviously got much more magnified, as it's been told, and urban poor was the worst affected. And uh, what we are seeing that, I mean, and also in, from a social perspective, schools are closed for 10 months, and this is resulting in a huge dropout. It will take some time to recover from this shock, but to make it worse, I mean, I think many wealthy countries are also cutting their overseas aid budget, and we need to build back better, but this will not be easy. Thank you. Thank you, Asif. Yes, we will come back to the, you know, uh, children at school and, and the burden placed on women. So thank you for mentioning that. Uh, so I'd like to go back to uh, your eminence uh, and ask uh, if you would share with us the key priorities that for the Vatican in 2021, as particularly as it pertains to the poor. In three minutes, please. Thank you. Well, for some time, for some time in our engagement with uh what we call popular movement groups, people on the streets and all that. We've identified what we call the three T's, okay? In Spanish, they are tierra, trabajo, et cetera. So it is the land, it is work, and it is a home. Okay, so the three objectives that we kind of, uh, you know, pursuing now is to ensure people a place to lay their head, and talking about home, we talk about the family, we talk about its security, we talk about its welfare. Then we talk about work, access to work, access to decent salary and income. Then we talk about uh, uh, land, as it an asset, as it were. You know, uh, as Steve talked about, starting off by giving people assets, okay? So we try to ensure that at least they have assets that can sustain everything that they do. So the three things are the objectives that we look, you know, we, we, we're rooting for. Thank you, Your Eminence. So uh, going to the point of work and, and uh, workers' justice and dignity and fair compensation, uh, recently, um, I'll quote the Oxfam, uh, wrote the governments around the world must act now to build a human economy that is feminist and that values what truly matters to society. Clearly, women have been put at the unfair end of compensation, especially that they have been involved in the care, heavily involved in the care economy, and underpaid and unpaid work. And I, I'm wondering uh, if, if uh, I'd like uh, Asif to share with you your views about that, uh, especially that you have been engaged with households getting out of extreme poverty. So, uh, how would uh, what has the impact? COVID-19 been on women specifically, what have you seen through your work and how can a feminist economic policies help your work in your area? Thank you. You have uh, two minutes this time. Thank you. Yeah. No, I think uh, essentially uh, Bangladesh is the best testament of women-centric development work. I mean, it showed that if you invested on women's health, education, and economic empowerment, the entire country's social indicators improve, and, and that impact actually would sustain I mean, our Brax founder used to say that women are the best managers of poverty. And at the same time, if you invest in their education, they become um, much more aware mother and the health indicators also improve in terms of neonatal death, nutrition, et cetera. So, so the work that we have done uh, uh, with the government over the last 50 years um, has led to much better social outcomes in Bangladesh and much more inclusive growth compared to the other countries in the region. And uh, we have shown great success in achieving MDG targets. Uh, but now the challenge is different. Uh, but the solution uh, obviously still lies in investing in women. Uh, but 
by also engaging men in this process as well. Um, I think in the post-COVID world, we can't afford to see that because of economic challenges, women are being marginalized further and their education and empowerment are getting stopped. Those uh, are, though there are early indications that we are seeing that the pandemic has been extremely harsh on everyone, but women are the worst sufferer. I mean, uh, we are seeing that uh, in terms of economic effects, in terms of family, their resulting food insecurity, increase of domestic violence, child marriage increasing as because the dropouts are increasing. I mean, they're much more expandable the schools uh, because of the school closing. And, and even small businesses where women were running uh, because of the, few, uh, the, our, the work that has happened over the last few years, they were getting shunned. And, and women also are not being able to tap into various government stimulus programs because of marginalization. So, so essentially, marginalized are getting even further marginalized because of the pandemic. Equity has, inequity has become magnified this process. And, and in this process, what has happened in this has the emergence of this new group, what we are calling them the new poor, who have fall, fallen through the line of poverty. And that number in Bangladesh has uh, sort of expanded from 18% to uh, almost at the height of the pandemic, it was close to 40%. So, uh, and, and women are the sort of worst sufferers. So whatever our focus is in the recovery and social and economic, women has to be at the center of it. Thank you, thank you, Asif. I, I want to go uh, to, to James, and, I, and James, if you could tell us uh, with, with all the suffering, you know, to the economy and tell us a bit more about <clears throat> supply chain disruptions and what productive capacity and what it could mean to local productive capacity and the need to look uh, into uh, how we can develop economies, especially in developing uh, countries. So, uh, James, uh, you have three minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, I think um, given that I, that I have only three minutes, so I just wish to focus on one important um, initiative, I think, that worth the attention of international community um, for the partnership. This uh, uh, promote, uh, promoting uh, productive capacity in uh, low and income, uh, middle income countries. So for the low and the middle income countries, uh, there's urgent need for affordable uh, PPE, diagnostics, uh, treatment and vaccines. And the global production capacity is failing to, 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 um, to, to ensure that such a supply to the low income countries. So therefore, there is a possibility and there can be an opportunity in light of the challenges to um, boost the pr uh, production in poor countries that to integrate their international uh, their production uh, network and facility into the kind of, uh, kind of productive um, uh, health um, ecosystem at the national regional and global level um, and and something that is good, that could be for health, for local economic development, and for global public health uh, security. Um, I think um, at this stage, we see short-term wise, it will alleviate supply constraint in, um, um, in, uh, in, in developing countries. Longer term wise, the local productive capacity uh, can nurture expertise and create quality jobs in low income countries and contribute to structural transformation and economic growth. So that is the import, important thing, but that requires a kind of industrial alliance, parallel manufacturing by multiple companies uh, in multiple locations. And, and that needs a kind of global partnership among the governments, local producers, development partners, and international investors, and, and also technology holders. Yes. So this is uh, this is the critical important. We need that partnership uh, to do that, and I think a number of countries are ready for that. Not all countries, but some like Bangladesh, um, like Egypt, uh, like uh, Morocco or, or, or Tunisia. Quite a number of countries can be um, can be ready for such a kind of production linking to global value chain supply chain. Thank you, James. I'd like to go to uh, the Cardinal, your eminence. I would love to hear your comments about that, access to, to vaccines, particularly for COVID-19, and the larger issue of access to medicines for people in poorer parts of the world. 
Yeah, your eminence, please go ahead. I think I think this is uh, this has always been a challenge. This has always been a challenge, uh, you know, uh, that we try to help uh, deal with. When this uh, pandemic struck, one of the issues we projected and we uh, said could have run into difficulty was that when news about the discovery of the vaccine came up, we were rooting for the fact that access to the vaccine will be equitable and will not become nationalistic or be determined by any such thing. But that's precisely what we see now. Governments are thinking about their people first and then see what else can be left for other people. Uh, we've seen this play all over and over again. Right now, as you know, the row is between the European Union and Aztec Seneca about supply. So, you know, this is uh, ongoing. On account of that, we would encourage very much so if the WTO can, can help to suspend intellectual property rights so that the vaccine, production of the vaccine can be undertaken on several local levels. Several countries do have the facility. They do have pharmaceutical uh, facility to be able to produce this. And if that was done locally, I think the impact of the, of the, of the, of the, of the COVID or the virus will be very much tamed or diminished. So access to medicines, especially vac uh, the vaccines in this case, is, is, very, is very real. We witnessed the deaths. Everybody is talking about new strain in South Africa, in, in Brazil, in the Amazon desert, and all of that. Therefore, we encourage you also one thing. Since access to the vaccine is running into difficulty, we're now encouraging the discovery of alternative cures to the, to, to, to the, to the uh, COVID. We, it, we, it's, we, now, we encourage people to look further afield to other local uh, you know, therapies that they may have. And we begin to discover a few which can help people you know, deal with the COVID and reduce the, uh, you know, the death rates until equitable access to the vaccine can be fashioned for all. Thank you, Your Eminence. This uh, probably speaks also to the tension between uh, nationalist policies, economic policies, but also policies with respect to increasing having vaccines within borders, as opposed to the, the call for collaboration and global uh, solidarity. Uh, so uh, perhaps I, I, I want to go back to James and, and what do you think about this tension even in economic policies between countries moving inwards and trying to, uh, you know, work through, through national uh, policies, and at the same time, the need for global collaboration to deal with the global uh, slowdown uh, due to COVID-19. James, go ahead. Yes, um, as we observed that during the pandemic, um, governments are moving towards, um, um, there is a dichotomy, in fact, in policy making. On the one hand, countries are putting in protectionist measures um, partly for national security reasons, partly because so that um, uh, they, 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 um, they use these measures to, um, um, to, to close the border uh, for trade and investment. Um, and on the other hand, we also see a kind of quite a number of countries putting in place measures to liberalize their uh, sectors that need international investment that can, um, can stimulate investment for jobs and for growth. So there's a dichotomy, in fact. I think um, at this stage, we see that G20 has been trying to play a role in, um, in contain uh, trade investment protectionism, particularly in the critical areas like a food, uh, food uh, supply chain and also um, a supply uh, of medical equipment and medicine. So there is a need for um, a broader kind of efforts in, um, in, in, uh, in ensuring that global value chains are functioning well and not to be disrupted by uh, protectionism. Yes, indeed. Um, actually, I would like to, to, re to uh, bring up that your eminence, you delivered uh, the Holy Father's Pope Francis's message to world leaders last year at the annual meeting in Davos. And I quote, pleading for high moral responsibility to work for the common good and urging global leaders to seek the integral development of all humanity by placing the human person at the very center of public policy. So uh, would you like to, to comment on where we are today from <laughs> your eminence? I think, I think all the discussion we've been holding now has been to uphold this. The human person must be at the center. Uh, in, 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 in several cases, on account of engagement, people engage in, they're talking about profit, uh, financial gains, 
economic whatever tend to tend to push the human person into a background. Now, why, one thing why why the Pope wrote that was that the dignity is the, of the human person is the one thing that you cannot compromise on. And everything that we do is supposed to be meant to uphold the dignity of every person. Uh, you know, James has talked a, a short while ago about, about you know, multilateralism or nations needing to come together. When Ban Ki-moon presented the SDGs in 2015, the way he presented it was that the SDGs were a human dignity narrative that leaves nobody behind. And if we're true to this objective, then everything we do in this regard should be to enhance the dignity of everything, not leaving anybody behind. And this is done on several levels. Nations can engage in multilateralism to do that. Non-national actors can engage in a sense of solidarity. What the Pope right now is calling these days a sense of fraternity, social bond, social fraternity, social friendship among us to stimulate living for one another, looking for the common good of the human society and how to uphold the well-being of all of us. So as a certain point, uh, we on the GERD, okay, we try to create a platform for economic policies, financial policies with a little bit of virtue, the virtue of common good, the virtue of caring for one another, the virtue of the human family being a single family united or one interconnected with the other, and to try to kind of hold up every system and induce us and make us, encourage us to care for one another. Thank you, Your Eminence. Uh, can we uh, then, uh, in, the, in the minutes that are remaining, I will ask each of you, and I will start with Asif, to please uh, provide us with, the, you know, in one minute, the top advice, message to the world on how to stop poverty from going viral. Asif, please go ahead. One minute, please. Asif, can you, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. I just uh, lost you for a minute over there. Sorry. Uh, I, I just, yes, would you provide your, in one minute, your top advice and message to the world on how to stop poverty from going viral from your area of work and from your perspective? No, I think... Um, I mean, in the post-COVID reality, I, I mean, we are not even talking about SDG targets anymore. I mean, if we are talking about eradicating extreme poverty from the world by 2030, I mean, we have to get our act together. And, and going back to what uh, um, the Cardinal was saying, that essentially it's the moral responsibilities of everyone, particularly the richer country. And when you hear about um, the billionaires who have made even a few uh, more billions, they have doubled their assets last year, while you see the ultra poor uh, suffering everywhere and, and women who are suffering, that you, you really start to think that what's wrong with the world. And there, there are serious in, inequity that if in, for our, all our interest, I mean, essentially, in just like COVID, like if not everyone, if every, everyone is safe, if uh, everyone is safe in a sense that we need to get the virus out of everyone before everyone can feel safe. Poverty is something like that as well, that we all need to work together because at some point, this kind of disparity will lead to serious social consequences across the world. Thank you. Thank you. James, in one minute, please go ahead. Yes, I just want to get back to this uh, building, productive capacity, uh, building productive capacity in producing essential medicine and medical equipment in low-income countries um, and integrate them into the global value chain and supply chain. I think there's a need for global action, a global partnership. That's what I would like to advocate. There, there can be 10 actions uh, to take. One is that to investment in skill development to ensure that um, uh, standards compliance in production. Uh, there's uh, sharing um, COVID-19 related technical technologies to ensure affordable um, mass production, target impact investors to access necessary capital, um, to build uh, partnerships to initiate lighthouse projects in low hanging fruit, um, and to improve investment incentives to increase local firm sustainability to use streamlined regulations to facilitate investment and investing in infrastructure, um, emphasize on the regional approach to, the, to reduce the cost and to increase the scope, uh, scale, 
and seek funding from official development systems, and lastly, to ensure sustainability of the efforts uh, despite the kind of unpredictable markets. With these um, actions that we can form a global partnership to, um, to build productive capacity in low-income countries and to integrate into global supply chain in producing essential medicine, not only for the short term, but also for longer term. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, Your Eminence, uh, last message to the world. I think with all the infrastructural, you know, details supplied by James and, you know, Asif, uh, what I'll add is to come back to, you know, the question you put, is the human person. The human person being central to all of this is not simply uh, as the beneficiary of all of these initiatives, but it's also the crucial actor, the crucial actor in making all of this happen. The, the, the infrastructural principles and basis and elements that James talked about, all of those do exist and they can be activated, set in motion by a change of heart of the human person, feeling for one another, kind of. So the human person is the center of all of this, not because he's a beneficiary, but he's also the crucial actor. He must change lifestyle, he must change thought patterns, he must change way of thinking and develop a heart for the other person to be able to feel for the well-being of the other. If that does not happen, we may have all the structures we want, but if the center, if the, if the, if the, if the one at the wheels or the helm of things does not change, attitude, morality, ethical considerations, all of that, not much will change. So the human person, yes, not only by way of protecting his dignity, but also by making him the crucial actor responsible for the well-being of everybody by change or feeling of a certain brotherliness towards each other. Thank you, Your Eminence. Uh, we have listened to our speakers and uh, we are reminded of how COVID-19 has sadly connected us in illness and in its aftermath effects. We're reminded of our interconnectedness on all levels, social, economic, political, environmental, and psychological. More than any other time, the need is for collective action, working together for solidarity for the human person, for the human family, quoting uh, his eminence. Collaboration is a moral responsibility in shaping a new normal that's sustainable and inclusive, with one clear objective being stopping poverty from going viral. I am grateful to my distinguished speakers. Thank you all so very much. Thank and you. to the audience, have a wonderful rest of the day. Please share your reflections on social media channels and thank you again to the World Economic Forum and to everybody. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.